When people hear my story and they hear that I was from KPT, I often get people who are overwhelmingly blown away. Kuhio Park Terrace, the largest public housing in Hawaii. It was rough. High school was four high schools, struggled. Yeah, I had free lunch. Back then, you had to like stand in line to get your free lunch, and so the whole school gets to see you. That second day, some guy takes my lunch and eats it. I think it was the third day I had a gun pulled on me. When you break it down, what does that mean? That means that you had no expectations that I should ever do anything just because I'm from KPT. So was there a turning point? I took the ASFAB. It's a test to determine your military readiness. So I signed up for the reserves. Our teacher there was this hard ass military guy, but he pulled me aside and he showed me a side of himself that he wasn't showing to the rest of us. And he said, my current thing is shifted energy. This is my fourth industry that I've scaled to international operations. Got a bunch of patents around that. So 10 years ago, we find out that there's only three high schools, public high schools in the entire state that offered anything beyond like an intro to computer science. And we didn't think that was right. And so we started Purple Maya to address that. We've expanded well beyond that. So we have adult training. So 12 weeks with us. We now average $77,500 as the starting salary of our graduates. One of the participants in the first cohort, he was homeless right before the class started, and he's now making $110,000 a year. So if you could go back and give younger Olin some advice, would you do it? And what would you say? I guess I would go back and tell the younger me that Greater Good Radio, Connect, Learn, Heal, and Grow is brought to you by Brain Gain Hawaii, a boutique executive recruiting, career development, and coaching firm. Learn more at BrainGainHI.com. Aloha, everyone. Thank you for joining us at Greater Good Radio. Today, I want to introduce you to my friend, Olin Lagan. I've known Olin for many years now, and I've watched him from afar and from close as he innovates his way to the top of the field. It's definitely been interesting for me to watch this native Hawaiian leader navigate and lead in both the community aspect as well as the business aspect. And some of the things that really stand out in my mind are how he's writing and filing his own patents. He's holder of many approved patents. Some of his inventions have been used by many people around the world. So without any further ado, Let's get to the interview with Olin Lagan. It's really about trying to get like the person's essence these days. I don't know. To me, I'm kind of older. Like, I don't know if I'm older than you. I'm 51. Okay, so I'm one year younger than you. So you, I'm 50. 72? 72. That's how you go, right? Yeah, so, in April. I'm November. November. Yeah, because I guess it's usually September or April. Like, you know, if you have to guess, yeah, statistically. <laughs> oh, is it? <laughs> yeah. So, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, because I was talking to my son, you know, we were driving. He's in AP calculus. So I asked him all these like math questions. So last week I told him, how many kids need to be in a room where they're random kids, where they're go there's going to be a 50% odds that two people share their birthday? And so I'm expecting him to calculate that. And he's telling me, well, dad, I think, first of all, your thesis is incorrect. So kids are not born equally on each month. <laughs> he's like breaking it down for me. And so we looked into that too. Yeah, we have some fun on our drives that, to school. Okay, so, you, so yeah, uh, I don't know. Our, ours, we just talk about food. <laughs> so <laughs> that's like, wow. And he was off by two. Um, he, he told me the answer was 21. I said, it's actually 23. So you calculated that in your head or? Oh, I did the math. Yeah, I did the math. And then he did it in his head. So, you know, for, so you, so what what's going on with the math like in your head? You just it's like automatic or this the technical aspect for you? It's just math. Yeah, math is interesting. Math is not um, my strong suit, but I think applied math is. And so it's the fact that I can take this mass quantity of data and then kind of string it around in my head and manipulate it like that. That's the the gift that I was given. It's like I have a I think I've got maybe six or seven large scale systems that I actively work on right now. And the entire schema for all of those are in my head. So if I have to make like a change then I'll parse it in my head and kind of move the data models around and then see where I need to like change something. And then, then I can make that change versus like all the time it would take to just do that on paper. 
Yeah. Wait, so at, even at 51, you can still do that um, at a high level? You're not finding drop off at all? Uh, I feel like I need to take more naps, but I still keep it in my head. Like, you know, I, I built a system for Hokulea, and yesterday they called and said they needed um, one part of the system. They're going to be porting it. And so then I'm parsing in my head, like, what is it? You know, what, what can I tweak? And I haven't touched the code for like, you know, six months on that one. Mm -hmm. And I can still do it and look around and then and so like, oh, yeah, I can, I can get you that. And then export that. Uh, Console for Native Hawaiian Advancement, I'm working on a system for them right now. It's about $300 million in the system. So it's a, the rent relief program. So I built that with Donovan from scratch. Wait, so what does that mean you're working on a system for them? So you're working on a, a technology system for them to deliver that program? Or? Yeah, so Council for Native Hawaiian Advancement, my first social venture with them was about 25 years ago. We did a Native Hawaiian, American Indian, Alaska Native Corporation together, like a Native Hawaiian organization. And um, I left that when I came up with the idea for crowdfunding. But then that social venture has sort of been the model for a lot of their other ventures that they do. And so like the HDA contract that they won and then sort of got tangled in lawsuits and hopefully they still end up with it. But the um, latest is this rent relief program. So they bid on with the, for the city and county of Honolulu to manage that program with the Catholic charities. Mm -hmm. And so that required a pretty significant amount of back-end financial systems because you have two agencies taking in input and applications from the public. You have to make sure there's no duplication across the board. You have to give out reports. You have to manage the data. You have to normalize addresses. So I built that underlying framework for the Council for Native Hawaiian Advancement and Catholic Charities. And so that started off at about $30 million in aid, but it's grown to about $300 million right now. $300 million annually? No, total. Over, oh. Yeah. oh, so over the span yeah, of the, the entire span thing. of this two, two years or three years. But then they called um, last week and said, we have this last minute request for a report and we need new data points. Like um, by ethnicity, we have to break down all the data. By gender, we have to break down all the data, you know, average distributions and stuff like that. So I parse that in my head. <laughs> I, I look at... All right, I know the data's here. I know the data's here. There's about, you know, 1,500 tables and stuff like that. And so there's a lot of data. As you can imagine for a scale that big. And then I'll, I'll figure out what to do in my head and then I'll do it. Yeah. So that's an example of the, the math that I do versus like the traditional calculus kind of math. It's more algorithms. And you find no real drop off at 51 versus like 20? It's a good question. I think there is drop off. But then with experience, you make up for that. Okay. And so like, you know, I've I gotten better over the years. And so that makes up for the drop-offs. Yeah. So yeah. I, I think kind of where I'm getting at that is like, I'm 50 now mm -hmm. and I find that I'm like slower. I'm definitely yeah. slower. Physically or mentally? All of it. Yeah. All of it. Yeah. I, you know, I, I agree with you on the, um, the physically side. So I was, I'm trying to change my routine. So now I'm going to go walk twice a week, sunset walks. And, uh, and like podcasts at three speed. And so like, I'm trying to do some things that are different in my mm -hmm. life to try to make up for the physical side. And then on the- So you're going to walk by yourself or you're going to walk with someone else? Uh, my wife goes with me mm -hmm. and she does a workout and then I go and walk by myself. So it's a good time to just like be by myself. And Wait, so walk. she's working out, doing something, but then you're with walking- a group. Yeah, oh. by myself. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. We just go to Alamoana together, talk story on the way, talk story back. I get out, do my thing. I meet up with her own cheese pal. Yeah. Oh, that's nice. And then how long are you guys going for? Uh, like two hours, hour and a half about there. You're not that wow, That's a long walk. <laughs> uh, it's not bad. Yeah. yeah. You just kind of walk and you get to see people and, and you know, when you walk, you see life, right? So when you drive, you don't, when you ride your bike, you do. But then when you're walking, you see people, you see their expressions, you can hear conversations, you, you can see kids playing, stuff like that. So wait, so are you paying attention to what's going on in your surroundings or oh, are you kind of into the podcast at three times speed? Cause it's. Both. You're doing all of that at one yeah. time? Yeah. And so it's like uh, I observe people and then I'm listening to the content. So that's sort of like the the thing I like to do. And you can stay present with all of that at the same time? Enough. Yeah, enough. I mean, that if I have to, if it's a science podcast, I'll drop it down to like two speed or something. Yeah. Cause... And how much of it are you retaining? I am not sure. <laughs> uh -huh. Enough though. Uh -huh. Enough that, um, like for me, it's it's not about depth. It's about breath. And so I like to just expose myself to different things and and partly too is like when you're walking and when you observe, it's emotional. And when you're listening, it's more like intellectual. And so I think those are different parts of your brain that operate. So, so what do you listen to at one time speed? One or time slower? speed, nothing. Yeah. Nothing? Yeah. Unless I'm watching TV with my wife. 
Yeah, because she thinks it's really unhealthy. Like if she's listening to this, she's going to be like, I thought you stopped doing that. <laughs> yeah, because she thinks I should like slow down and just listen to everything it wants to be, but I can't. It's just really hard. Like um, Netflix finally, I've been, I wrote them a couple of times and they finally have on their app only, you can go up to 1.5 speed. And so if you watch a, a film or a documentary at 1.5 speed, then yeah, it's a little faster. I, I do it that way too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, but I do tend to drop it down to one time speed if it's something kind of profound, I want to hear it again, or um, maybe it's really technical. I want to kind of piece together some piece, you know, it's like sequential or something. Yeah, I don't think I've, I don't remember the last time I dropped something to one speed. I have done some things twice. You know, like mm -hmm. I'll, I'll listen to a, a, a science podcast. I'm like, I want to hear that part again. So I'll listen to What it. if the speaker speaks fast? Uh, that's a good question. I only r remember when they speak slow. Like Malcolm Gladwell is one of my favorites. And that brada is yeah. real slow. <laughs> so he, he can go three and a half speed if I had that option on the, the dial. So Yeah. I find that too. If they talk slow, like for me, my interpretation of slow, then right. three three is like a normal mm -hmm. kind of speed. Yeah. Yeah. But I think also like, you know, um, you drop out a lot of the words too. So a lot of content over time is about these keywords and, and relationships amongst them and, and concepts and stuff like that. And so, you know, the getting the poetry of the way that that is communicated is not my thing. You know? mm -hmm. Like I, I appreciate like someone like... Um, Dr. Uh, Tyson, you know, like the way he describes stuff is really poetic and, and it's beautiful. And I wish I could express myself like that, but I appreciate the concepts more than the poetry. Yeah. So do you remember like when this kind of high speed analysis characteristic for yourself started or it's just always been like that? Yeah, I think elementary school, just like reading and just trying to get through everything quickly and um why i don't know you know just just um i would read and and i I would wish that i could read faster like i'd read and read and i spent so much time in the library like a lot of my childhood was in the library you know like when my mom borrowed money to buy my first computer i'm at the library and the, at that time two books are on computer programming only the entire library only two so i borrowed both Read them both, uh, it, it wasn't very um, mind blowing. How old were you? Uh, this was 1981, Texas Instrument TI 994A. So I was about 10. And so I, I found a users group, and I, my mom took me through this users group, and you know I'm there and I find my peeps, like these, maybe six or seven old guys, and they had like the amazing setups. Some of them had disk drives. One guy had a scanner. I couldn't believe it. They had like monitors. I didn't have any of that stuff. I didn't have a hard drive. I was using a cassette recorder to, to save my code. And so um, I remember like being fascinated. And at the end of that uh, thing, my mom said, yeah, you're not going back there. <laughs> yeah, those are not your peeps. Yeah. And so she, she was kind of weirded out by that. I was really bombed back then, but uh, you know, I, didn't, I just moved on. I didn't I don't wait, remember. So, wait, so why did your mom say you're not going back, but you kind of wanted to go back? It was just, I, I guess she made the decision that that wasn't a place that I needed to be. You know, like it was hard for her to get there. We had to catch the bus. You know, we, we weren't, um, we're, she was pretty busy. Four kids, single mom. And so I think part of that played into that. Like she probably saw that as like, that's probably not critical for you. Like it's a nice to have versus like a must have. And so she wasn't going to make time for that. But it was done in love, I think. So like I didn't feel anything negative from her. So you're... What what are you in amongst the four kids? You're in the middle or the youngest? Yeah. Oh, you're the youngest. Yeah. What's the spread? So two years up, I have Kaylee, my sister, and then twelve years from there, Julie. Okay. Another fourteen from there, oh, two from there. Sorry, is uh, Kathy. So there's a huge gap. So uh, Kaylee and I are a couple years apart, and there's a twelve year gap, and then Julie and Kathy after that. Wow. Wait, Three so girls. that's all girls and you? Yeah. Oh, so your whole entire household are females. Uh, yes, yeah. For the most part, yeah. Did, hmm. did that kind of shape anything for you now or did you learn something from yeah. that that you kind of hold with you now you feel is valuable that could be shared? I think um, the piece that I think I missed was just that father figure. And so that's a pretty important piece for anyone, you know, boy or girl. And so I got that through like my brother-in-law and, and other family members and stuff. So I wasn't like completely devoid of that. I still feel like there's a void because of that, but I wasn't completely devoid of that. But I think the other challenge is my two other older sisters were so much older that they moved out when I was young. So it was just my mom, my sister, and I. 
and she's developmentally challenged. And so in some ways I didn't have the moral guidance to, to like, for example, my first software program I ever wrote um, back when I was 10 was this, uh, you know, um, fortune teller. So I, I wrote it. And then if you put in your name, it'll tell you your future. So of course I, it, you know, you put in Olin and it told you like these really awesome things. And my sister being developmentally challenged when she put in her name, it just told her these awful things. And, and so, um, and I thought it was funny back then because she didn't understand that, that it was I who wrote that. Right. So, you know, I, I had some, um, Growing up to do that, I didn't have um, the the guide rails to to keep it in. So, I think from that perspective, that has changed me today because it's hard for me to. I, I guess I I haven't really thought about it enough to describe it, other than I have to get better as a result of some of those things that I've done in the past. So, would you be okay to tell that story? A little bit more in depth like what did you do you wrote something you don't have to tell me what you yeah. wrote but it's like you wrote something she read it and then the response and you know what i mean like yeah it was more beyond that so like i don't know what i saw i probably said like you're gonna be uh, you know awful or yeah you know what a, what a 10 year old would write right really stupid stuff but i think it's more not being embarrassed about being in kpt we were living in Cohio park terrace being embarrassed that i had a development tilly challenge uh sister you know all the kids teased me I didn't like that. Um, being embarrassed that you know she was not, uh, you know, someone I could I could feel like I can hang around with and stuff. So it's really that I didn't I wasn't there for her for sort of in the childhood that we had together, and that was wrong. So if you could do that again, you would change. I would one hundred percent. Yeah, I should have had her back, and I didn't. Yeah. How's your relationship now? Um, she's on the Big Island. So she's living in Hawaii Island with my sister Julie, and you know to. Now she is the most, in some ways, happiest person I've ever met in my life. Like, for example, she got cut working in the yard on her leg mm. and she, didn't, she doesn't complain. So she put a sock on and, and after about a week, my sister noticed that she started to limp and she's like, what's going on? She's like, oh no, it's, it's fine. So a couple of days later, my sister took off the sock and her foot is infected, but she doesn't say anything. So it takes her to the hospital. She has a flesh eating bacteria. It was so bad that they had to amputate her leg that day. And, uh, and, you know, when I, I spoke to her on the phone and she didn't mention anything negative. She's like, oh yeah, I lost my leg. I, they're going to get me something to help me walk. And like, just so positive. Like she, she's like as present as present can be. Like, this is the moment, this is the situation and it is what it is. And I'm just going to move on. And, and that's how she's wired. And she's always been like that. And in some ways, isn't that what we all want? Yeah. And so she was born with that gift. So what kind of developmental challenge is it? I think, I don't know what the politically correct term is, but her development is around at that six-year-old level. So she would be equivalent to someone who's at six in terms of how they see the world and how they parse the world and communicate. Can she work or? She tried, you know, she tried at Goodwill and they let her go. So she wasn't even able to work there. And then she worked at Salvation Army. She had some challenges there. She was let go. And then she did some work at um, Lanikila, and then they also let her go. Yeah. Yeah. My cousin has uh, Down syndrome, same age as me too. So mm -hmm. he works at, at those kinds of things. So it's always in a good mood. Yeah. Like I'm um, really happy, very simple mm -hmm. way of looking at things, which is, you know, it's quite nice. It is, but she also is not able to understand responsibility. So for example, when she was at Salvation Army, it was never about doing the work, but rather just being and talking to people. And, and so if you asked her to do something, she would do it and then would quickly forget and go back to doing something else. And in some ways, it's disruptive for a company, even one like Salvation Army. So you know, she didn't fit in. So do you think that maybe kind of your technical take and, and all this kind of um, high speed and so on has to do anything with being exposed to her and watching her? That's a good question. I don't think I was. Not consciously, yeah. but maybe, you know, unconsciously. I don't think so because the earliest memories I have is of this like mind on fire. And it was before I even understood about my sister. You know, when you're young, you're innocent. I just remember being um, uh, fascinated by everything. I, I still am. You know, like my son and I will also Google one thing on the way up. You know, like uh, this past, uh, this last trip, it was a, we were following a bus. 
So I asked him, like, why are the buses yellow? And so we start talking about that. And, and it's pretty obvious why, or probably pretty obvious, but it's good to kind of think about it, kind of walk through it. And then we look it up, right, and, and see what the actual answer is. Yeah. What was it? It was so that they can be seen from a distance. It was an unusual color. And so that, you know, they stand out because it's important they're carrying kids. Mm-hmm. And that most buses in the U.S. are for transporting children for school, not for transporting adults for work. Yeah. Oh, yeah. interesting. Yeah. So Actually, that, when you said bus, I was thinking of like the bus, you know, like uh, yeah. mm. Fossi Limo kind of bus. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Those has rainbows and, and all that on it. Yeah. But yeah, it's kind of cool. So I always like looking at the world differently. And so that's sort of the been the gift that I was given is just this insane curiosity. Like I'm okay with, sometimes I'll ask something very stupid or it might seem really crazy because I'm not parsing the world the same way. I'm looking at these things in, in very different lights. And as a result, um, you know, sometimes once in a while, something interesting comes out from that. So what is it that catches your interest typically? Science usually is one thing. Like, you know, my, my mom taught me how to make rice. And she taught me that you put your finger, I don't know if you did that too, but you put your finger in and you fill the water until it hits the first knuckle. And so that's not enough for me. It's like, why? Why does it work like that? You know, so, you know, then I'll I'll look into it and learn from it and then figure out like why that rice cooker can operate when my knuckle is clearly not at the same depth as hers. And then be able to like describe that. So what was the answer? Uh, the answer is in physics. So water does not go above a boiling point, usually 212 degrees at sea level. And so when you fill water in this pot, what's happening is that uh, no matter how much heat you add to it, you can add uh, a million degrees, it's going to stay at 212 degrees. Uh, that water is going to be like a cooling effect to keep it at that. And so when you press the on, what you're doing is you're causing a magnet to stick and can complete that circuit. So now you've got uh, a heating element that's boiling the water the water's keeping that at 212 degrees until there's no water. So now when the water's gone, what happens? Now the temperature goes up. So when temperatures go up, magnets lose their magnetism. So there's a certain uh, temperature where the magnet is, is no longer a magnet and it pops off. And then so therefore it's not heating anymore. Well, I mean, technically what have now that I, you know, in, in older life, what I know is that it drops down and it still completes a circuit, but it runs it through a resistor. So now it's in the same heating element is in the warm mode. And so knowing that I've now used rice cookers for all kinds of things. Like you fill it to the top with water and you put taro inside and you just turn it on. And it takes about three, four hours for that water to boil off and it turns off. And now you have perfectly cooked taro. Done pancakes in there. You can do stews in there. It's a pretty interesting, simple circuit. Wait, so what does the finger knuckle have to do with that though? The finger knuckle was just an approximate amount of water that would be needed because with rice, it's not, it, as long as you get close, it'll always cook perfectly. And so, because it's like, if your knuckle is off by a quarter inch, it really doesn't matter. You know, you're adding a little bit more water. And with rice, sometimes uh, it being soaking in water is okay because it's so hard that uh, so only a certain amount of water gets in there. So there's a, a huge forgiving ban of, of rice. And so, unless you're like making sushi rice where you have to like measure it, like you can just dump water in it and it'll work. You know? Wait, so even if you had like, two cups of rice, Mm -hmm. like uncooked rice, or 10 cups of uncooked rice, then you only needed the water to be that one inch or so above the surface and it'll still cook on. So it's not like, so so what if you put like, you know, up to your, you know, third knuckle? Then it will cook longer, Mm -hmm. which means it might get soggy because if you soak the rice, it's fine. But if you're not adding heat to it, it's permeable. So it's going to get into it. So your rice is going to be a little bit soggy. Because that's too far away from that norm of, of above the, the thing. And so whoever figured that out, like from the 20s or 30s, like to use your finger, it, it's definitely the way that it still works today. Wait, so was the first thing that you invented the, um, the fortune telling program or did you do something before that? I think in terms of inventing, um, the first thing that I invented was my own tattoo gun, like how to make tattoos. And so that's this... See this dot right here? Oh. So that's the last remnant of it. So this was fifth grade, I think. So I had squeezed my arm until all my veins popped. And then I, you can still see, but this, this part here was free of any veins. So even in the fifth grade, I knew that I shouldn't be like going into the veins. And I created a lightning boat all the way down. And so it, I went down and I created a lightning boat. 
And then my friend is a doctor. He took it off, but he left one dot so I can remind myself about the dude. He removed that. Excellent. Because uh, normally you can't you can see the white and yeah. stuff around it. You can't see anything. It, it was an expensive machine where he got it once a month. He's a plastic surgeon. Uh -huh. And he said, he's like, if you're on call over the next year, and if someone cancels, you come down in 15 minutes, I'll take it off for free. So he took this one, left the one dot for me. I had an O here and I had an O here. One sitting and it was completely removed. It was gone. Was it sore? No, I had no pain. So it's like this laser. So what that laser does is it doesn't, destroy the skin, but it rather blows the ink up into really tiny particles that your blood can then take care of. And so it, it lets your body clear it because your body can't move this, oh. this ink is too big. And so- What, it, what uh, doctor is that? Is he local? Local, yeah. So Dr. Bob Peterson. Okay. Yeah. Well, I guess you want tattoo removal. <laughs> Go to Dr. Bob Peterson. Yeah, I don't think he does that. No, but oh. uh, he, he's, uh, he was chief of surgery for Kapiolani. Uh-huh. And uh, he was also my business partner in one of my companies. So. Well, which one was that? WorldPoint. Oh, WorldPoint. He, yeah. So a medical doctor was your partner in, in that? Yeah, yeah. Brilliant man. So he was, uh, he's first an electrical engineer. So he, he had his um, master's degree in electrical engineering, was building medical equipment. And I guess, I guess the story I was told, he was inspired by the stuff he was building. So then he goes to Harvard and gets his degree in, in um, medicine and then start, becomes a surgeon. So. So it's kind of overachiever. Yeah, six or seven languages. Uh, I now speak Russian. I can probably speak to him in Russian. Uh, I haven't is, seen is him. Is he a still while. alive? He's still here. Yeah, I, I think so. I haven't seen him in a while. Wow. Kuwait. So, so maybe take us on like, kind of the brief timeline of the development of your, you know, companies, companies or yourself and so on. Yeah. So, yeah. high school was four high schools struggled. Um, you know, I think that story has been told before. What, once every year? No, I started off ninth grade at, at Farrington and it was rough. It was really rough and because I was living in KPT at the time. And so I think I went to school for five or six days and that's it. Oh. I just dropped out. Well, I was getting too nuts. Uh, yeah, it was pretty bad. You know, I, I got, um, I was bullied. Like, um, yeah, I had free lunch. So I'd show up and then back then you had to like stand in line to get your free lunch. And so the whole school gets to see you and you get these fake quarters and two fake dimes and then get your lunch. So I get my, my free lunch and the second day some guy takes my lunch and eats it and he thinks it's funny. Uh, the, I think it was the third day I had a gun pulled on me. And so this Filipino boy thought he was funny and I was scared. I didn't like that. And so it just wasn't for me. Like it was not an environment that I felt like I thrived in. And so I just stopped going. And then uh, my sister took me in. So my sister in Waipahu took me in. And so I lived with her. So then I went to Waipahu High School. But same thing. Like I, I really didn't pay attention to school. I went, uh, I must have went more there, but I probably still had all Fs in, in high school. And then I went to Campbell and uh, with my sister, I was still living with my other sister at that time. And then uh, I moved in. With my other, so I was going back and forth between sisters. So then my other sister lived in Waipahu, but in the district was redistricted. So she had Pro City as her district. So then I went to Pro City for my last two years when I had to go or I'd go to detention home or something like that. So they put me in an alternative learning program. The entire day I was in auto shop. In the morning, auto painting in the afternoon. That's it. Yeah, no math, no English, no nothing like that. Yeah. Is that what you chose? I think that was what was chosen for me. And did you yeah. like it? Uh, not really. Yeah. Oh. So you pretty much was in like semi-jail is what it sounds like, right? Like, uh, I got to be here. I don't really want to be yeah, here. Yeah, you know, but... we, we had this lady, Candy, she's a state counselor, would come on Wednesdays and like circle the guys up. It was all guys in our class, like 15 or 16 of us. And, you know, it was not a, a group of the folks that you want to upset at that age. Yeah. So I was in with some pretty rough crew. And so, you know, she'd do things like go around, like, you know, let's do our, our opening session. And, and then the guy next to me is saying like, oh yeah, you know, I'm, I'm still, um, I, I still like to sell my bakalolo and, um, you know, like, like really they were opening up about some really awful things and they come to me. And I was just like, you know, I, I like to surf. I don't really like school. And then, you know, it was almost like I wasn't ready to open up, like compared to some of the stories I was hearing. And so, yeah, that was rough. That was really rough. But I finished it. I, I went, uh, you know, welded and painted and worked on cars and stuff. Wait, so what would you have opened up about? I don't know. I thought, 
um, I thought I did open up. Like I just oh. didn't like school, mm -hmm. but it was just compared to some of the other stories I was hearing, like some pretty wild stories were coming out of that group. Yeah. Two of my um, classmates committed suicide, not in during my senior year, but after. I remember one of the guys, like I went surfing with him and, and he was driving like 110 miles an hour. I started freaking out like, dude, you're going too fast. He was flooring, going North Shore. And uh, then that, that was one of the guys that killed himself too. It's just like, it was really traumatic for the, the years after to kind of hear the stories of, of some of the, the guys that were in the group. So how did you get through that? I didn't get through. I just did it. You know, I just like you know, fix it. I need to fix something. I'll fix something. I wasn't sure what I was going to do with my life. So it was just, that was what I was supposed to do. And I, I wasn't conscious at that time. I just kind of went with the flow. So was there a turning point? Yeah. You know, um, I took the ASVAB. I'm, I don't know if you know what that is, but it's the test to determine your military readiness. Mm. And I like created patterns on it. I didn't read the questions. I'm like, I did the Christmas trees, I did a shaka. And so it was like, I, I was just doing whatever, right? Because they, they yeah. were trying to get us in the military. The Marines calls like, hey, you did good, son. You're like, we want you. <laughs> so you mean you just did any kind of drawings on I was thing, going nuts, yes. They, I they put said, Shaka. You did great. I said, yeah, you, you did great. You know, you'd be a good candidate. And You think they even looked at that I thing? I don't think or, they looked at what? that thing. They looked oh. at who finished this, the test. Is it, I don't know, but that's that's my guess. Like, there's no reason they should have called me. Uh, and so I was like, yeah, I'm not interested. And then the Navy Reserves were like, oh, you know, we, we want you to, buddy. And so... Um, and at that point, I was ready to think like, yeah, I guess I got to do something. So I signed up for the reserves. Mm -hmm. So, And that's the point of my life where it changed because I left. And so I went to Great Lakes, uh, Chicago for boot camp by myself. Like nobody in, in my family kind of gave me advice. Like, and this is what you expect. So I took up a giant bag of lihimue and like I was thinking, can I take a surfboard? Probably not. Yeah. yeah. So I remember landing there and, and um, they take away all my lihimue. I'm like, what the hell guys? Like this is, these are my snacks. It was interesting because they, they waited for 80 people to show up and then you, you're a group and then the next 80. So I got there at the tail end. So I, w I went overnight without mm -hmm. that 80. And so I made friends with um, this um, African-American guy and this Holly guy. And, th and then finally we had 80 the next day. And then the first thing they do is like, they take you into this room. We all change into military clothes and they cut your hair bull ahead. And then they put you back in the room. And I remember I couldn't find my friends because <laughs> I'd never seen that in my life. We all looked the same, right? Mm -hmm. And so and I was like one of three brown guys out of the 80s. So they found me, mm -hmm. but I swear I couldn't tell like, uh, you, you were the guy I was talking to. <laughs> you know? So that was pretty trippy. But that was my first experience with um, life, you know, outside of Hawaii. Right? I went to Mississippi as a kid, but that was the first time like as an adult, 17 years old. I went right out of high school, like a few weeks out of high school. Yeah. Wait, so what did they do with your Lihing Mui? Probably throw them away. Yeah, like TSA. So. Why'd they take it away? I guess you're not supposed to bring anything. Like you're supposed to come just as you are, like nothing. And then you just submit yourself and go through that. Yeah, it was just like, that was the first time I saw, I, I saw like pranks and racism. Um, I saw uh, people being really mean. It was also the first time that my peers saw me. And so I was like, um, there's this week called Hell Week. And it's like seven or eight weeks in and you work for, I don't know how many hours a day, but you go to bed at two and you wake up at four. They're trying to deprive you of sleep. And so you're in this delirious state for an entire week. And one person is excluded from that, but it's the person that everybody votes on. And so of course they voted for me. And, and so I was excluded from that. And so that was the first time in my life that my peers had given me a gift just for be, me being me. Right. So that was like one step. Did they the say right. why they did that? Uh, I was probably the most neutral guy. Like it was pretty rough. Like there was um, the blacks, whites. Um, there was a lot of tension. There was some racism. I saw one guy get beat up in the middle of the night. Like they um, filled up a, a pillowcase, like like you see in the movies. With soap. It wasn't soap. It was like I don't know what they put in there, but it just put stuff. And they were they were whacking this guy. Yeah, and um, yeah, it was it was pretty crazy. And so I didn't like that. I didn't like any of that stuff. Wait, so how long were you there? Three months or so in, in Chicago. Then I went to school for three or four months in Mississippi for heavy equipment repair. So mm -hmm. they, they sent me there to learn how to fix diesel rigs, hydraulic systems. So my job was going to be that. And that was, the fir that was my turning point, really. So when I got there, I was still like, my high-speed thinking was there. So like I just powered through everything. So 
I never studied. I did everything in the class and I, I never studied outside of class, but I was, um, I never got anything wrong in any single test. You mean like hundred percent you got right every, single, every test. single thing? And so the, our teacher there was this hard ass military guy, but he pulled me aside and he showed me a side of himself that he wasn't showing to the rest of us. And he said, like, you know, you've broken our record for the school. Like I need you to leave the military and go study engineering. Like you should be an engineer. Like I got the equipment up and running faster than anyone else. I'd pass the test. And he knew that I wasn't putting in an effort. So he thought it was a gift that I had. And so um, no one had ever told me that in my life that I should go to college. I was the very first person in my entire life to do that. So, so do you feel it was a gift or uh, you feel like you worked on it? Oh, it's a gift. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. I, yeah. Knowing what I know now, I, I definitely got lucky. You know how like uh, everybody has like 100 units of, of gifts and some people get it sort of. Are you sure everyone has 100 units? 100%. 100 units, <laughs> but they're spread out unevenly, yeah. right? You know, mm -hmm. like somebody might have like 99 out of the 100 in like love and, and the rest a little bit um, lacking. But man, that love is off the charts. Yeah? And so uh, in my case, I got a lot on some of the analytical stuff and then not so much on emotional or some other pieces where I, I 100% have some lacking. And, yeah. So if you could distribute it how you want it, what would be your distribution? Uh, I would spread it evenly across all the intelligences. I would 100% do that. And which intelligences are, are those? You know, like emotional, okay. um, you would have uh, uh, compassion, kindness, uh, of, of course, the traditional types of intelligences, the different types of loves, like I would really try to make that as even as possible. And so I would give up what I have now to have it more balanced across the other realms. So you would rather be less exceptional in that one area and almost kind of baseline for yeah. everything. Yeah. Well, why would you rather be baseline as opposed to, you know, exceptional? Because I don't... Um, I don't know what I'm missing on the other side, other than like, for example, if, if my son Ryan comes home from school and he's having a rough day and he's not able or willing or can share verbally what's going on, but it's in his face. Like, I can't see that. And oh. so, you know, in some ways like that, that is so painful to be stuck with that. Like there's every part of me that wants to see it, but I can't. Like I, I've gone through therapy, I, I've read, I've, I've thought about it. Uh, I've taken classes, some multiple times, like nonviolent communications, which sure helps with the emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. And I still can't read that face when he's sad. And so if he were to say one thing, I would be right there, 100%. But I am also not um, uh, gifted in that emotional sense where I know that I need to make that space and push and be there and, and witness or whatever was needed. And so... To me, like that, that's life, like connection, helping. And so if I'm not able to dive in that world, like there is a void that's now between him and I that is going to be hard for me to jump over. So what you're saying is that you want a higher level of that emotional mm -hmm. kind of sensitivity because that's what creates the connection between you and the people that you love. Right. And by missing that, there's a feeling of disconnection, which is causing some... Um, discord in your system. Yeah, you know, we were dead for billions of years and we'll be dead for billions of years in the future. And so like this really small, incredibly small slice of life that we have this gift to live, you know, what's important is connecting with others. And, and so is it the important thing, the con the feeling of connection or the actual connection, or is the important thing being able to recognize it? Support. I think support, because it's my role now as his dad to support him. And okay. so... And that's a role that I play and not as good as I should. And you feel that you're not supporting him? I, I support him, but in other ways, you know, like he and I have those conversations about the yellow bus, you know, we'll figure that out. But him coming home bummed, you know, there's not as much support there. And maybe that's the support he needs at this point. Did he tell you that? No, that's my um, fatherly knowledge, knowing that without question, there's some pieces of support that he probably needs that he's not getting. But you never talked about it. I try, but I'm not very good at it. The reason I'm asking on this is that I spent years, the last few years in this kind of area, mm. a lot of it. Right. 
Um, so the thing that I'm kind of wondering is, is, is it a big deal necessarily to him or is it more just a big deal to you? Yeah. You know, there's a lot of love songs that describe like, it's important to me, but maybe not so important to you. And therefore there is the disconnect. So perhaps there's some of that going on. Um, I mean, in a rationalizing way, I hope you're right. Like it's important to me and maybe I'm not um, as unsupportive as I think I might be. Yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, we the kind of hardship that you've been through in your life, right? there is a, definitely an advantage to shutting down the emotional sensitivity. There's a right. huge yeah. advantage right. to stay safe mm -hmm. on that right? and to make very strong meaning of a lot of things technically. Mm -hmm. So... The hard thing is that a lot of times it's inaccurate. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? We'll create stories around things that are not necessarily... I'm not saying it's not, yeah. but I, I do it like all the time too. And I want to make explain things and make sense out of stuff and so on. It's It would be interesting though if um, to hear what he had to say on that. I guess in the house of tomorrow, I hope I have the privilege of having those conversations with him. You know. Oh, he's not at home anymore? Um, no, no, no. Like, I'm just, I, I guess I, I'm thinking of that Khalid Gilbran poet um, who talked about oh. our kids dwell in the house of tomorrow. You know, like, in the future, we'll probably have some conversations about that, and I'll see how accurate or inaccurate my assessment was. You know, like, I feel like um, in some ways I've shown up for my boys in ways that I wish I, I had. Mm -hmm. You know, like... Um, for the first 16 years of their lives, from Noah and Ryan, my wife has been at home. And so we had that luxury of her being there. And then I would end work at three or whatever, when it came home from school, we'd go walking every day. And, and so there was a large part of their life that they probably had no clue that either of us worked. <laughs> you know, like we were just like living, they go to school and, and come back. And yeah, I've spent countless hours with them. And, but it's, it's in, a few realms that I'm strong in and not so much those realms that I'm not so strong in. So I'm, I'm hopeful that that was okay. That mix was okay. And that that's the hopeful part of me. But I also recognize that perhaps on the emotional side, there are some, some things that, um, you know, a lesson that they'll have to live through and, and be stronger because of that. So, but what holds you back from just asking? Say, hey, um, Ryan, this is what I, I've been feeling. I'm feeling like I'm not yeah. strong in this area with you and I'm lacking this sense of connection. It really bothers yeah. me and I just wanted to know what is going on in you. Is that accurate or not accurate? Yeah, it's a good question. So my older son, Noah, is a lot like me. Yeah. So he's gifted in ways that I'm gifted and, and struggles in ways that I'm... And I've tried that with him and we have not developed that emotional relationship where he feels comfortable responding okay. in ways that that's true. So I haven't made like a hundred attempts or mm. a thousand, but I've, I've made more than, more than a good fair share of attempts to try to connect with him on that. And I haven't, um, I haven't had a breakthrough from that perspective with Ryan, um, similar. So he, he is emotionally gifted. Like he's very, um, very gifted at seeing the world from that connection perspective. And it's pretty amazing. And I've tried to have those conversations with him, but I, since I never, I never really related to him in that ways. Like we haven't had um, a, a good heart to heart along those lines. It's definitely harder when you get older. Yeah, because my my kids are um, my oldest, almost twenty one. My youngest is at eight. Mm. You know how it goes, right? Like you learn as you yeah. go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And yeah, it's definitely it's definitely a bit challenging yeah. as they become adults. Mm -hmm to kind of open things up. Cause sometimes it's, it's so painful that you just don't want to go there. Right. You, you, you know what I mean? But it's consistency, right? So I, what, what I have hope for is that they've seen me get their back for so many years and support them in so many different ways that, you know, it's going to account for something. Like I read this book from this sports writer. He wrote a book about him and his dad. And then at the end of the book is like, here's my email. If you got a similar story, like write to me and I want to, I want to hear it. And he got like 30 something thousand letters from folks. And, and so he writes another book. He says, um, he opens it up as saying, I read every single letter, found two things that were consistent across 
every single letter. And it, it's these two things. One is he doesn't think that for the bulk of the stories sent in that the dads would remember that incident. And so to him, that was remarkable. It's like they're writing about stuff that they remember that the dad might have thought it was just everyday stuff. And the second thing was, try as he might, he couldn't find anything materialistic amongst the responses. And so in some ways, that was like um, like the sample set of, of good, good daddyhood. Yeah? It's like you, you show up for your kids on the everyday things that, that just is just normal everyday things. And, and it's not about money. And so... Um, in some ways, my life is guided in some ways by that. Like, I, I, we don't do things that are surrounded by money. We don't, we don't go on trips. You know, we don't uh, buy stuff that, that you know, has about materialistic and we just have these everyday experiences. You know, the interesting thing about, as I'm listening to you talk about this, yeah. is that you say that your like, EQ is um, not at a high level. Oh, yeah. With right? that question, yeah. But I mean, your sensitivity around pulling together public-private partnerships or integrating in like cultural and things that are meaningful into technology and so on is kind of seamless. So when I look at it, I don't, I, I don't live in your body, but it, to me, I would not have said that was readily apparent <laughs> externally. Yeah, and that's I'm be- fairly persist, uh, perceptive. Yeah, um, and maybe I'm seeing myself wrong, but I think. What you're seeing is me problem solving something that I wish I had. You know, like growing up. Don't we all do that? Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, like um, all the companies I've started all have some social mission. All the nonprofits, uh, you know, half my life I dedicate to in service. And so all these things that I've done are really in service of solving some of the challenges that I see that need to be solved, like 100%. And, and they're so important to me to be solved because I live through them. And so that, that doesn't require as much EQ as maybe you think. <laughs> yeah. So, but but I, I think what it does re- require is um, people along the way that help me see how important kindness is and how important service is and, and how important uh, giving freely without expecting anything in return well just even showing up yeah you know those actions speak louder than just talk so, yeah yeah i think so yeah yeah so what's the is there a general theme be that kind of weaves together all of the um social initiatives that you work on yeah a couple um the first theme is around education and so when i i think back and and i didn't plan this but you gravitate towards things if you just let yourself be to how your spirit actually wants to move. And so I found myself in these educational roles over time. So 30 years ago, uh, College Connections Hawaii, getting kids supported in our most underserved communities. So no, Andrew Oki and then yeah, Ren, Ren, yeah. Okay. And so Native Hawaiian Scholars was born at that time. And it got me really thinking about how is it possible for us to support these kids in ways that are meaningful? And so... Like one really big aha I had was it, it was really simple in some ways, like showing up and having a teacher say, what's your homework? Let's just go through it together after school. You know, not come with a lesson or not come with like this preordained uh, curriculum and stuff. Just like, let me just help you with your homework. And let's just do that every day for this week and see where it goes. And, and so like some of those solutions, which might seem so simple, are profound. And so that made a huge difference? It made a huge difference, yeah. Was it because now they finally have somebody that cares about them that maybe sees and hears them? Yeah, you're like one one of my theories of change and uh, why we started Purple Maya uh, ten years ago. So like all these educational things sort of accumulated in in a decade ago, launching what is now one of the larger STEM uh, educational networks out there. Was um, purple is the rarest color in nature? It's hard chemically to produce it. You know, you should YouTube that. It's really interesting. Like for That's nature, why I like uh, Seth Golden says purple cow, <laughs> right? <laughs> Yeah. Well, I didn't know about that, but yeah, but yeah. purple is um, uh, hard chemically to produce. And so you, you have to really want to be purple for nature to produce it. And so yeah. it's hard to see, but it's everywhere if you look for it. And so that sort of is the mantra for kids, like seeing the purpleness in them. Like it's there, even though it's hard. So what would the purple represent for these kids? It, it's whatever is real about them. Like for example- Their uh, authenticity? Yeah. Like one good example of that is I went to Maui. So we, we have a class in Maui where 
every kid in the class is kicked out of the DOE. So they're no longer oh. truants because they're not part of the, the DOE. So there's this institute that, that allows them to, to keep learning. How many were there? Like 45 in the, yeah. in the school. And so I, I mentor this eighth grade Hawaiian girl. Uh, she wants to learn how to build video games. So I fly to Maui. And so my first question was a dumb question. It was like, uh, do you have a computer at home? And she, and she was like, oh, uncle, um, I live on a beach. Like, I don't have electricity at home. Like uh, really a terrible uh, question. But she then goes on to build two video games. Like she comes early because she doesn't have a computer at home and, and learns. And, and, you know, and, and the thing with, um, with her is like, I, you can still learn so much from these kids. Like, for example, when you watch remotely, we were using this Stanford model, the, the flip model. You, you watch the video yep. in your time. And then the, the, the Kumu just works with you through the problems. It's much more effective. So watching her scores, like she takes these quizzes and just like jamming and then it drops to nothing and it's just flatlining and then comes up and then jamming again. And so what would you think is going on? Like, um, I, I would think that maybe she has access during a certain time yeah. and then at other times maybe she has no access to it. Yeah, so I had all these kind of questions too. I thought it was exactly that. Yeah. Being houseless is going to cause you some issues with like catching up and stuff. But it was nothing like that. It was the most beautiful pattern I'd ever seen in education. You know what was going on when she dropped? She was pausing her stuff and helping the other kids. Like how powerful is that? And so, it, it, so that's purple, right? So like, I, uh, but it was purple because that was impossible to see unless you ask or you, you think about Instead of just saying like, wow, this, this is, it is what it is. And, you know, I'll take that and, and learn. And what can we do better so that she doesn't like do this? But now it's like, how can we encourage more of that? And so that's an example of um, just finding those rare patterns where you change how you think and you, uh, you lead differently as a result of that. So that purple piece that you you noticed with her, you asked her? No, one of her other kumu asked like, because I was in the, the daily Kumo, so okay. the other Kumo figured out like that was what was going on. And I had not expected that. And so, did you talk to her about it? Um, I did not talk to her about that. So, what ended up happening was we lost her that semester. Yeah, it was, it was like one of the best stories ever and then one of the worst. And so, she, she thrived for that uh, class, built two games, and then she wanted to go to. HPA on, on Hawaii Island. They have like advanced computer science. And so all the kids from like Punahou and Iolani, Kamehameha were going. So she applies, she gets in and kills it. You know, we, we were told that she was like the life of the, the group, the soul. Uh, and then after that experience, um, she, that was Na, Nalukai, yeah, comes back to Maui and her mom pulls her out of school and says like, this is not the right path for you. And so she left school. And the principal of the school tried to find her. And I, I heard from uh, Donovan a couple weeks ago that they might have located her, but I have not talked to her since. But in some ways, that's also our vision with Purple Maya. Like, you know, you have to be realistic. So we know that we've got our kids for like this really small time. And Maya is banana in Hawaiian. So if you listen to like Olono no Ia, banana, unlike other leaves or uh, unlike um, most leaves, they point down. And so in um, Hawaiian sort of wisdom, they represent listening to the earth, like listening deeply. And Maya also, you know, Hawaiian men in the past, they've prevented women from eating Maya or bananas, except for the Iholena variety, which was like this purple variety. So the women could eat that. And we saw that as a really good um, analogy for tech. Like we think it should be for everybody. Uh, and so Maya also is about listening. But then Maya also has a purple flower. And so if you, you know about banana trees, you know, they're, they're clones. And so when the flower comes out, the tree is basically dead and that banana hood will come out after that. So if you're a banana farmer, you're maybe like, could be seen as a, a flower farmer, purple flower farmer. So that's the stage we get of them. So we have them for this delicate purple stage and that's it. But then maybe that's enough, you know, then they can figure out their home banana hood. And so I have faith that our connection with her for one semester was enough. It has to be. So Purple Maya, maybe if as people are listening in or watching this that may not be familiar, how would you explain it? So 10 years ago, we looked at, so I was carving poi boards with Donovan and um, I don't drink, so I'm drinking my um, non-alcoholic you know, beer. Uh, yeah. yeah. So like, yeah. And 
of course, we're, we're a bunch of brothers and they're laughing at me because I got my Oduos and they're all drinking Hanukkahs and whatever. But then we start talking and uh, we find out that there's only three high schools, public high schools in the entire state a decade ago that offered anything beyond like an intro to computer science. And so we keep talking about diversifying the economy and yet our kids don't have that access. So we didn't think that was right. And so we started at uh, Purple Maya to address that. How do we get computer science into public schools in the most underserved communities, but then root it in Hawaiian culture? Because we didn't think that you, can, you should do computer science just through computer science. You should do it in support of your culture, in honor of your culture, and in an extension of your culture, because you're part of this chain. And so you, you don't just take what your kupuna passed on and replicate it, but you take that because it's your kuleana to, to work it and see what you do next and move on because, you know, that, that progression. So that was Purple Maya's initial concept. And so we've grown statewide to do just that with kids, semester long computer science engineering. So, you know, building hardware, building software, games, like whatever the kids want. And it's all rooted in Hawaiian culture. Like, for example, if you want to teach a kid about a circuit board, you can take them to the lo'i. Like that water system is, has the same analogy to the electrical system. You got transistors, resistors, capacitors, batteries, flowing electrons on the circuit side, but you have vai, that water that flows. And so you got lo'i that you flow down from the stream, you store it, speed it up, you gate it, you open it up. You and lo'i is a taro patch. A taro patch, right. right. So that analogy is perfect. So you see yourself as part of this revolution versus like being gifted this revolution, but you're part of it. And we've expanded be well beyond that. So we have adult training. We just finished our eighth cohort for workforce development. So these are adults that want to learn tech. So 12 weeks with us. We now average $77,500 as the starting salary of our graduates. That's the Salesforce one? Salesforce. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's 50% higher than the 10-year median coming out of UH Manoa, the, the top university here. So, so how, how was that funded, the Salesforce piece? We got a grant to support okay. that. So we, we got a grant. First, we got some other grants to do like a trial, and then we got a grant to expand it. And so, you know, here we are on our ninth cohort to, to do this. And I think there's going to be many more classes and then to come. And people in that cohort, they pay for it or they... No, yeah. It's free. Free. Yeah, we got a text message two weeks ago from one of the participants in the first cohort. He was homeless right before the class started. And he's now making $110,000 a year. He's going to get married. He's all excited. Is he's he on, here? He's here. in Hawaii? Okay. Yeah, biggest fan. He works remote for a company on, mm -hmm. on the continent. I think it was a continental company that hired him. But that's what we're doing. 12 weeks later, you can get a job in tech where it's not related to uh, or connected to tourism. See, that's, what, that's why, I, uh, you know, as I'm doing um, recruiting and so on for different companies, mm -hmm. I'm always talking about retention mm -hmm. and then options, right? Mm -hmm. Like you have an option to go for a few months mm -hmm. and come out and earn a six-figure income. Right. Okay, what's, what's going to get this type of person who's mm -hmm. pretty capable, obviously, mm -hmm. to come and work for you and stay with you? You know what I mean? Such a such an interesting world we live in. Yeah, you know, I, I was the keynote speaker for Honolulu Community Action Program a couple of weeks ago, and I love sharing stories. And I'm also conscious that, like, that's a difficult story to share because our social agencies are in contracts where they can't pay that. You know, our early childhood educators aren't making that. I was on the board of Parents and Children Together. It's sort of an educational theme in my life. The other thing, by the way, is a Native Hawaiian sort of work. And so all my extra work is with Native Hawaiian communities, and but all my overall work is usually with education. But it's a hard story to tell. Like tell a group of folks that are ma making thirty, forty thousand dollars well below the poverty threshold that if you quit and come with us for 12 weeks, we can put you into something likely close to six figures starting. That's tough. Wait, so how many um, how many apply for this program? I don't have the numbers. We don't. Um, we can't accept everybody. Uh -huh. So what we've done is we put some gates up front. So like for example, uh, you need to do this on your own and get through this self-paced course. And if you come out of it with a certain score, at least you're showing that you know we're going to give you that seat and not lose it to someone else. And so we're, we're trying to be responsible with the number of seats that we have. It's all remote. Mm -hmm. But we have a, an option to come in class too, if, if that's what you need. Yeah. I mean, I, I have nothing but good things to say about Purple Maya. My 
my kids have gone through different programs with you. And you've folks. been to our events too. I've seen. Yeah, you. and I've come to the uh, fundraiser, right? <laughs> yeah. So then, um, and then my my youngest is on the Minecraft one, and then mm -hmm. the one that they're doing the music and stuff. She mm -hmm. just loves that. I mean, I, we listen from the side and so on. That I only have good things to say. Yeah, I appreciate that, but we're not, you know, I'm I'm not going to say we're experts in it too, because if we were, then, you know, I wish that the world had a ton of experts on how to do right by our kids. But what we do know is that we will try to see them because that's, that's one of my theories of change is that the people in my life that changed me, like that military instructor who pulled me aside, he saw me and he made it crystal clear that he saw me and he wasn't going to end that conversation without me knowing clearly that he saw me. And so like, that's an important part of it too. The other one too is, um, you know, you got kids and there's a part of them that will never believe you. Like you might tell them like, you, you're awesome and you know, I support you, but they know you're the dad and you're supposed to do that. You know, and coaches are, have the same kuleana and, and pastors and all that. So part of our thing too is you've got to have your peers provide some form of, of self-reflection and self-value that they support each other because they can support themselves in ways that we may never be able to. And so we can foster that. Like, for example, um, KPT, we had a class at KPT, uh, Kuhio Park Terrace, the largest public housing in, in Hawaii. And one of the kids built two video games. Again, this two video game uh, theme is coming up. And his friends at KPT are all calling him the next Bill Gates. Like, I mean, this guy's a genius. Like, he, I can't believe he did this. I don't know if he's a genius. I don't know if he's going to be the next Bill Gates, but it doesn't matter because um, he's getting that self-value from his, his peers that I'm sure his self-worth stock went through the roof. Like that's changed to me. Well, think yeah. about this. Look, look at what they're seeing him for. Right. Right. So you could be seen, you know, in order to get seen, you can do, you know, start uh, jacking cars. Right. Uh, you know, beating people up, whatever. But, He's being seen for this area, which, you know, nor maybe in the past he might get made fun of, right? For being a nerd and yeah, that. Yeah, I was in KPT building games and right. they want to beat me up because of that, right? Yeah. Like, you nerd, you dumbass. Like, you know, it was, it was not it makes, great. It also makes other people feel like less than. Mm -hmm. it's, that's their own deal, right? right? Like, oh, look at Olin. He's smart, but oh, making me feel, uh, kick right. his butt, you know? Like, so that's, that's, mm -hmm. that's kind of amazing. You know, that's, that's how you can... That's one way to help you get out. That's purple my So I, I think if that's the only class that kid ever takes from us, that's enough. That's the purple fleece. And he's going to turn into whatever banana hood he's interested in because we've had him for that delicate stage and it's, it's fine now. Mm -hmm. So that's one of our theories of change is like these little uh, episodes with, with our students. We have a, uh, we, we did purple prize. You're familiar with that. We're supporting companies that have a mission that's rooted in Hawaiian EK or Hawaiian knowledge. And so we've had um, about 50 companies go through our, our, our various cohorts and awarded maybe a quarter million dollars in, in funding to support their companies without any equity that we need on our side. Mm -hmm. All of our programming is free at, at Purple Mayo. Yeah, that's amazing. So, so what else are you working on then? Like what, what keeps yeah. most of your mind space going? This is my fourth industry that I've scaled to international operations and so clean energy right now. So I like picking new industries because there's a lot of growth when you do that. And I think one hack I have is the next company I start in a brand new industry, I have such advantage over others because I have all this other sort of unrelated experience that's only going to bring innovation to that. And so I really believe that innovation is nothing more than taking two things well known in the world and smashing them together in new ways. So you're standing on the backs of people that came before you. Uh, and so I, I am um, like art, anything, hula yeah. language, um, you know, picking up and recycling cans, like mm -hmm. everything you do has like innovation if you learn and dive in. And so my current thing is shifted energy. So we, we are trying to solve for the clean energy challenge that is very unjust. So if you're a homeowner and you want to, um, reduce your energy bill. You can put solar, put batteries, get an EV, change your appliances. Like the list is endless and you'll get paid for each and every one of those. But if you're a renter, there's very few options. And this is a worldwide problem. So the clean energy revolution we're going through, it's like when you buy poke and you go to the store and the restaurant and then everything has prices except for the poke bowl. It's like market price. It's kind of scary. Yeah? What does that mean? Is it 50 bucks? 
And so um, half the people are on that market price unknown for the rest of their lives to pay for energy because they can't um, invest their way out of it. So my company's trying to solve for that by engaging these communities at scale. So we have 3,500 installations. I'd figured out some methods to use water heaters as the means to do that, to get folks into these programs, and then spanning off from that to other different types of asset classes. Got a bunch of patents around that. We are providing advanced services to Hawaiian Electric right now and Maui Electric for using 3,500 installations, and we're expanding like crazy outside of Hawaii. So what's the genesis of this? Like, what, When did the idea come to you? How did it how did it kind of sprout itself? What, yeah. What's the story behind this? Yeah, so I, I sat on the board. It was called the Clean Energy Steering Committee. And this was during the Lingo administration where Hawaii was the first state to mandate into law that clean energy um, must be 100% from renewable sources by a certain date. So no other state had done that, like put the stick in the mud saying, by this year, we're 100% renewable energy. And we did that as the most... Um, and not the word pilau, but we used more uh, fossil fuels than any other state, like per capita. So we were going to go from the worst to the best. That was our thought. So, But sitting from that vantage point, I could see clearly that we were going to do it on uh, using the path of least resistance, you know, using electrons as an analogy. That's what they take. And so these are the homes that can go solar, put batteries, and you see it now. Look, our policies mirror that. If you are a homeowner, go look at what you can tap into. There, there's no limits to what you can tap into. I haven't driven a gas car in 20 years. I tapped into those benefits. My, my home has been zero energy for over 15 years. I've tapped into those benefits. So I, I, I know. And so um, that was the genesis. Like, holy moly, we, we can't do that. We can't do that. So when I got off the, the board, I ended up starting shifted as a way to address that. And I didn't know how to do it. So it took about three years to figure it out. Talking to hundreds of people through surveys and directly installing equipment in, in well over 2,000 homes, like different types of equipment, looking at the data. I bought personally uh, 30 different systems, some from Europe that I wired into my home. So like, see, like, can I use this to participate? And then finally figured out like, yeah, it's the water heater that is going to be the tool that we're going to use. So you're trying to figure it out for yourself first, or you were, you were trying to look and see what the, what were the biggest opportunity in the market was. Yeah. You know, it's, it's about um, scale. So it's like, how do people use energy and then what's possible? So of course you want to look at the, the big users of energy and, and water heating was one of the biggest ones. So that was high out on the list, but it wasn't just water heating. It was other parts of, parts of energy, but there's only so much you can do. Like one of the insights I had from that work was, I, I may have been the first, I'm not sure, but we had figured out that DVRs, the digital video recorders were using about 100 watts per hour. 24 hours a day. And to put that in perspective, a fridge uses about 50. And so oh. these DVRs that look like, you know, VCRs, but th they want to record like three streams of data at once. So they got like this high end uh, video cards, maybe two of them. They've got two disk drives and the old style. And there's no incentive for these companies to make them energy efficient because they're not paying for the electricity, but they got to get these out for free, right? As part of the, the deal. So they're so the cheapest parts. And so when we meter them, that blew us away. 100 watts is the highest usage of energy for a lot of these families. And so some families had three of them and they had no clue that it was you know, related to that. So we helped by um, sending out 2000, these mechanical timers from Long's, like you set the time that you wanted to turn on and you just like, we pre-configured it and just mailed it out to people that requested. Every zip code in the state had people requesting. You plugged your DVR to that and then it would go off from midnight to 6 a.m. And then in time for you to catch like the morning news and stuff like that, which is like even just getting that much time off had some pretty significant savings. So it wasn't just the water heater, but we figured out some other- Like how much too. in dollars would you save from something like that? So 100 watts, uh, if you're able to get 12 of that, or let's say 10 hours a day, so that's one KWH, that's uh, 50 cents. And so 50 cents a day you can save. So you can easily save 150 bucks a year by just cutting out the 12 hours you're not using it anyway. Or something like that. And that's just for one. Uh -huh. Yeah, uh -huh. So it's pretty significant. And if you can do it where um, you learn that this thing is bad and you get rid of it and you go through something like, uh, you know, like uh, I don't, these plug-in things like Roku and stuff like that, you can still get cable from s services like that. They use like five or six watts when it's on only. Pretty significant savings. You're talking about $300 
plus per year. So in some families, we computed that the electricity to pay for the DVRs exceeded the amount they paid to the cable company for the service. Yeah. And we had not seen anyone compute that before. So, but that's part of the way that I think. You know, I'll look at things and and I don't just assume. I'll just look and look at the data. And so after I computed that, that's when I was like, wow, that's that's not good. So to the layperson then, what what does shifted energy provide? What do you do? Yeah. So if you think about a home, a home uses on average one kilowatt um, all the time. So I, people don't think in kilowatts, but just think of kilowatts as like one unit of time, but it's not it's not used at the same time. It's so like when you come home from work, you turn things on, you heat water, you cook, you clean, you turn on the dishwasher, so you use a lot more kilowatts at that time. And so your usage has this really wicked pattern, like in the morning, you, you know, use a bunch, and in the afternoon, you use a whole bunch. But the average is about one, one unit of, of power. And there's more than enough solar and wind to provide every family with that one unit. But there's a difference between when it's produced and when it's consumed. And that's where the problem lies, is that we have enough renewable resources, but we're not creatures that will use the power when it's available. Like for example, um, solar power is from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Imagine doing everything from that period, like your, your laundry, your cooking, your cleaning, your dishwashing, like that's not going to happen. But if we did, we would have enough. So shifted energy is really about trying to shift the demand to meet the supply. And so that's what, um, that was the big aha for me, is that a lot of clean energy is solving it on the supply side. That is, how do you store the extra energy when it's created so that you can then distribute it when it's needed? So that essentially is the battery solution. And it's very expensive to do that. You know, if you took every battery ever made in all of human history, every single one, including all the cars that are on the road, and you plugged in the world's grid, you might get like 20 minutes and then you run out of battery. So there isn't enough battery capacity yet to do all of that shifting. And so our approach is let's make the demand match the supply to the best extent possible. And then what we can't shift, then you bring in the battery. So you need less battery. So one example of that is the water heater. So your water heater should not be heating water at 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. when everybody else is using energy. Let's heat the water before that, like maybe during the solar day. So all the energy that's going to heat your water is coming off residential rooftop solar. And at night, maybe the wind power that's coming from the North Shore is going to heat the water for people that need it at night. So if you can time the heating of the water to coincide with the available renewable, you've got a battery. And the way that we do that is we use advanced machine learning to make sure that we consume as much renewable energy when it's possible, but we don't turn off heaters so long that you would interrupt your access to hot water. So that's the magic that we do. So our entire company is really about finding those abilities to shift energy without it being perceptible to humans. What stage are you at now with the company? We're still early stage. So we have our seed round. We closed at the end of last year. So four and a half million dollars. Um, some pretty interesting investors came in in this round. We have customers in three countries, uh, growing quickly in Canada. Mm -hmm. In fact, that's probably going to be the largest operating part of our company for a while. And we're in eight US states as well. And so we think that this model is going to be valuable everywhere. So my vision though, is that every utility on earth is going to need us. Because at the end of the day, you want to shift first because that's the cheapest form of energy storage is shift first. And then what can't be shifted, you then use batteries to then provide. So how are you protecting your IP, your concept and so on? We, we filed some patents. This year, we're going to file 20, mm -hmm. 20 patents. And then didn't you learn how to do that yourself or something? Yeah, I was on a panel last year at the patent office. Uh, they, they brought in some in indigenous innovators and I, I explained that the patent process is very unfriendly. It's very expensive. Like, um, and it's just, it's too daunting. And so I, I um, was told that they have services where they train you on how to do like provisional patents. So I, I, I challenged myself. I thought, huh, I wonder if I should do that. Like I, I have a patent attorney. I can work with him, but maybe I should do the 20 this year on my own, but in service with my team. So five of our, our engineers are working with me and our goal is to file 20. We filed three so far um, this year. We have four queued up right now. 
and I'm filing them with them, naming them in, in the thing. And we're just doing provisionals now. And at the end, we're going to have a real patent attorney turn those into real patents. Mm -hmm. But that has taught me how to do it myself. And it's not easy. Like the patent website is is really, really broken. Like one example is like you, you, you get your patent completed how you want it, and then you create an account. And then you try to log in, but it doesn't work. And no matter what you try, it doesn't work. But what they don't tell you is, and I only just get a call, is that somebody at the patent office has to like physically approve your account and then turn it on like a couple of weeks later. And then your login will actually work, but it's not listed anywhere on the site. Like their site is just so difficult to use. And so if I can learn it, then perhaps I can teach, I'm teaching the five engineers right now, but maybe I can teach other people too. Hey, you can file your own provisional patent by yourself for a hundred bucks. And you have one year then to see if there's something there to turn it into a full patent. So can like chat GPT or s some other type of AI help with that? Yeah. I use chat for all three patents this year, mm -hmm. chat GPT. And, th and as part of the patent, you have to put in sections that don't add value to the invention, but add value to the, um, the concept. So one section is like, talk about the industry that your patent is in. Like, why would I spend any time on that? I went to chat GPT, you know, tell me about this. I, I described it and it spit out this two or three paragraphs that I just copied and dropped it right in the patent. It doesn't do really well for the claims because that's where you're, you're adding value. So at the end of the day, the claim is what is most important. It, it's the most important part of a patent. And like, what are the claims that you are putting down as you being the inventor of that you have to do by yourself? Okay. So, so on that though, would you use it where you'd get a general kind of bullet pointed piece of the claims and have chat GPT kind of touch it up or no, no? that one, not I, even. I, I, the process I'm using with my team is I will spend two hours with them and we bullet point the claims and then we work backwards to the um, description of the claims and then we finalize to go back into the claims. And so I have this like, I'm bouncing back forward and that has been the most clarity that I've come up with for that. So we, describe the claims, we get it mostly right, we then describe the claims in, in bullet points, and then we find where we miss some claims or have to modify claims, and we go back. And then the, the team that I'm working with will then fill out the blanks. And so we get the core concept completely ironed out in two hours. And so using this process in two hours, I can file any, any patent. I mean, I can file the structure, and then someone can then fill in the blanks mm -hmm. to, to make sure that uh, it reads well and has some clarity. And then after the provisional period, or just before that, then you're you're turning it into an actual um, patent. If it's if it's worthwhile, yeah. So are your patents primarily utility patents, or are they design patents? I've got both. Um, mm -hmm. The most interesting one is a patent filed with uh, Carnet and Kevin, to my um, good friends that we started uh, Chippin, uh -huh. and we called the concept social commerce. And so this is the idea I had, where um, after Noah was born, my office passed around a card they were late. And so uh, it got stuck on somebody's desk. You know, they, they write like, congratulations on your son. Here's like a gift card. And so they apologized and said, you know, so sorry, just get stuck on people's desk. And I had done um, a statewide CDFI or community development financial institution. So sort of like community banking prior to that. So I put those two concepts together. It's like community banking plus it's hard to collect money. And so I called it social commerce. And so Carnet and, and Kevin joined me and we created the first crowdfunding company. Talking about chip in, right? Chip in, yeah. So that with patent, Carnet Williams and, and, and Kevin Hughes. Hughes, yeah, yeah, two brilliant people, and so they were the right co-founders for for that. Uh, and Song Choi also joined us as well too, during the early days. Uh, so the um, the patent around social commerce, it was hard to because that concept is well known. Like people collect an organizer collecting money. I still have the, the the napkin, a picture of the napkin that I, I drafted where I, I had an organizer. And this person was collecting money from the public and, and his or her social circles for the purposes of whatever the, the group wanted, whether it was pre-purchasing or funding, or it didn't really matter. So that was the concept that didn't exist at that time. And so how do you patent that? And so we had patents that went around some of those concepts. So. Yeah, I remember that. Because wasn't that just after Envision Hawaii? You guys were doing it like right around that period. So maybe like 2003, early, yeah, early 2000s. 2002, I think, I, I think I had the first idea in 2002 or three. Yeah. Yeah. What happened to it? It was really hard. We got about to a hundred million dollars in transactions and, um, being the first, we were initially holding all the money 
uh, the fraudsters came in like at scale. Like we could not control the fraud. Like fraud would come in, and um, and the the fraud was was really bad fraud because they'd use like stolen credit cards. So someone would create an event, uh, use stolen credit cards. We collect the money and then pay it out. But then Visa or Mastercard pings us two months later. Like oh, those are our stolen. But that's okay. We'll take it from your current stash. But we, 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 this current stash is to be paying out for that. It's all chargebacks. It's all chargebacks. So the chargebacks started to go up. So we switched over to PayPal. And then once we did that, we couldn't monetize it. Mm -hmm. And so it was hard because now we're no longer holding the money. So yeah, we're that transaction engine. But then how do we then cover our operations and, and make our investors happy? And so at that point, we pivoted. And so the pivot went to the, the most valuable part of the company at that point. We didn't know this at that time. I, I think if we had stuck to crowdfunding, perhaps uh, we wouldn't be using GoFundMe, we'd be using Chipin or, or you know Kickstarter and stuff would still be on these um, systems that we built because we created that whole thing. In fact, I think we have the first recorded instance of a blog asking the public to pay medical bills. That was at Huffington Post back in 2004, I think, using Chipin to fund this woman who was going blind because she mm -hmm. couldn't afford the medication. So, um, but we didn't know that, so we pivoted. I had left the company at that point because the pivot went to a different kind of company. It was the, the technology that we created to create these widgets that would decentralize the fundraising effort was then more useful and valuable because that could be monetized. Mm -hmm. And so I, I spent about six months um, exiting out. So I told my co-founders, like, my second son is born. Like, uh, I, don't, I can't do the seven days a week um, because my heart's not in that. And so I'm going to spend whatever time it takes to transition out. So it might have been six to eight months. So I built the first version of that um, that precursor that became Sprout mm -hmm. with Kevin. So Kevin and I built that with this guy we hired off of um, uh, Craigslist in Massachusetts. This guy, uh, Matt, I think was his name. And yeah, and so then uh, Sprout then grew quickly and it was acquired by Inmobi as the number three ad company on earth for like mobile ads to to replace their API. So successful exit from that perspective. So with that, then you have a patent that's defensible and you can- We don't own it. No? So that was sold to all those patents were oh. sold. So theoretically- um, So they control people with they, that or what? 100%. So oh. if you look up social commerce, some of the concepts that we came up with are absolutely what you see out there. So mm -hmm. they could be. I, I mean, I hope they don't because I don't believe in that, but it, they could. You know. But if they own the technology and someone is infringing that, they should get a license for that, like yeah. a legitimate license, but not necessarily try to like um, extract more wealth than it should be valued at. Hmm. It's probably a valuable patent, if I can. I haven't thought about it enough. Yeah, I think, you know, that might be the most valuable piece that they have from it right now. Possibly. There's, yeah. there's a potential to... Possibly. You know, yeah. Troll it. <laughs> yeah, because back then, when you, th when you think about it, it was like... Um, you know, crowdfunding, the term wasn't invented. Mm -hmm. My wife thought it was a really crazy idea. It's like, are you going to start a company around that? Like an organizer collecting money? Yeah, I remember like uh, Carnet, Kevin and I, we pitched uh, Dr. Marty Tenenbaum. He was a professor at Stanford with Jim Clark during the uh, Netscape days. And, uh, and, and uh, Marty is like this e-commerce guru. He's the chairman of CommerceNet, which is the sort of like the place where- Is that where, Carnet's friend? Uh, it was Kevin's friend. I knew him from- my role time, my time at roll points, and, mm. you know, I went to Japan, mm -hmm. uh, hung out with them and, and got to know him a little bit from that period, but he was, he was, uh, Kevin worked for him. So Kevin and Mark Anderson actually worked for, um, him before Netscape. Oh. And so he was the guy that, that recognized Kevin, recognized, um, Mark, um, and then put them together on a team. They built like the first auction site on earth and a lot of things. But anyway, so we're pitching it to him as, as the head of commerce net. So. I remember telling him, like, this is our, our idea. We don't know if this is viable. But like, we've never seen this. And he thought it was the most refreshing take on e-commerce he had seen in a while. So they took our entire seed round on the spot. So that was kind of nice. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, for WorldPoint, then, how did that come about? What's the story behind WorldPoint? Yeah, Dr. Larry Cross. Um, and what was your experience before that to even qualify you for that? What was my experience before that? So I was, um, you know... Or the transition, you know, like yeah. something prepared you and then you went to that. I don't think anything prepared. Yeah. In college, I was, uh, I was back to my speed reading kind of crazy days. And so I did pretty well. I graduated with a 4.0, usually perfect in most of my classes. 
And I took like seven or eight classes a semester. So I had two undergraduate degrees and I did all the things that you're not was supposed that to at do. UH or at UH, that? yeah. Okay. So I just, um, I didn't study, you know, I just did, did my own thing. And cause I had that, I have that gift of absorbing quickly. And, and so I did well enough to get into the East West Center. And so mm -hmm. as what I was told, the youngest fellow that they've ever accepted. So I was an undergrad at the time. And so the, I got a full salary for that. Um, they, they were committed to pay for my grad school, whatever direction I wanted to go. I studied in like five Asian countries during my last two years. Um, I skipped out a lot of class, but I still did pretty well in college. And so I met a lot of folks like Larry Cross. And so he was the founder of Hawaii Online. This was back in 1993, 94. And so he had the idea of creating a company to make Hawaii the best place to recruit. And so like creating this database of, of human talent. And so um, he pitched me to join. And his friend was Dr. Peterson, the, the plastic surgeon, and this other guy, Jerry and Brian, an, an attorney. So that they recruited me in saying, what do you think about this idea? And so the company at that point, they're like, what are we going to call ourselves? So back then, nobody was registering domain names or not enough. So we registered URL.net. And we're like, we're going to be the universal resource locator of, of talent. And so that was the original concept of, of um, WorldPoint. So we did that. Uh, and then it just was too, way too early. In 1995, building a labor pool online just wasn't the right time. And so we ended up building websites for about six months. So that was a pivot. So I was the only guy working at that time. So the other guys are doing other things. So, so it's just me. Mm -hmm. And I built uh, crazyshirts.com, um, Sears, Ren Spooner, like all these like local companies that were doing commerce online. But with Crazy Shirts back in 90. Five, they wanted to do uh, commerce in Japan. And so that was the, the pivot. So I remember doing a deal with Bank of Hawaii that let us uh, do online transactions. But how we did it was I had a Mac. And so we had our Linux server that was the front to the, the world. So the Japanese person would come on. It was all in Japanese. Put in their credit card information. And then I would send it over this local network to this Mac who would then jump on a phone line and call Bank of Hawaii and get the approval and then talk back to this other machine and then give the approval to the, the Japanese client. And so that took about 60 seconds to do, which was really fast back then. So like the thing would spin and I thought it was like the coolest thing ever. And so that became WorldPoint. So the thing that we learned there was the world was going to struggle with dealing with multiple languages. And so let's focus on that. And so I built out this thing that we call Dropbox, which is what, you know, you drop your stuff in there. So our clients would drop stuff into this really cool Dropbox and then we would route it to the right experts, culturally, language experts around the way, about 5,000 of them that we built. So we ended up growing that to, let's see, how, how many, I don't know how many clients we have, but if you name companies, we, they probably use our service. So Disney, FedEx, Mercedes, NTT. So it was around the world, these large companies were using our service for for that purpose. And what happened to the company then? In 1999, I got burnt out. So we had acquired a company in Europe. So I was traveling to Switzerland a lot. We, we had operations in San Francisco, in Texas as well. I was traveling 50% of the time. Like I was just pitching clients. And so my role there was chief architect. So I'd invented all the tech and I was the primary expert when we worked with our customers. <laughs> so I had told my, um, my co-founders that it, it just got so big and we were, we were making money. We were also spending money. And so like we, we, we took the top two floors of some downtown office and put stupid things in there. $40,000 plasma screens. Weren't you guys at 1132? Yes. The first right. two floors. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we had, you know, a hundred thousand dollar feng shui. Thing. It was just like. Yeah. You had, had baller kind of office. It was, it was not it was what nuts. I wanted. And yeah. you know, the masseuse came in every day The the, the caterer came in and provided lunch and we had you know, Govinda's dropped off juice every morning. So we try to take care of people really well, which I appreciated, but I knew that we were bleeding cash. And so, but we were on top of the world at that point. I think we were the best company in the world in that space. So I told my co-founders that I had to tap out. Like it was just too much for me. And so I was 29 at the time. And so I gave them one year. And so like, I'm not leaving right away. So let's over this one year transition, I'm going to do whatever I can to, to set the company up and then I'll leave. And so 
uh, and I did that. So I stayed for one year and we, I transitioned all of my uh, duties over and I joined the Peace Corps. So that was my sort of like exit. And, and uh, yeah, that was, that was um, rough because I, a year into that, because uh, when I left, I left at the height of the company. Like we were number one uh, doing this work. The Olympics had just picked us up. So the, what was going on in, I think it was Australia at the time, we were doing all that translation that people were seeing. And so out of here, you know, we were running 24 seven operations out of Hawaii. And so when, um, when it started collapsing, it was really hard for me to, to deal with because I, I felt this need to come back. But I also felt this need to finish what I started as a volunteer. And so I, I, I knew that I was going to stay, but I also knew that going back, I, I wasn't able to fix that anyway. And so, yeah, that was pretty rough because I didn't take money out or anything like that. So I went down with everyone else when, when World Point went bankrupt. Write it up, write it down. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. But I learned, I also learned that you have to be honest and true. It's like I told my co-founders that, you know, it was really rough for me to be in that position because I, my heart was, wasn't in it where we were uh, just working too much, seven days a week, traveling like crazy. Like, you know, I barely saw my wife. So if you look at that whole time period, mm -hmm. that world point experience, mm -hmm. right? What would be the number one kind of benefit you pulled out of that or lesson or, or anything? Yeah. You know, the, most positive thing that I got from there was it doesn't matter that you're from Hawaii. It doesn't matter you look like me. You know, sometimes my subject and verbs, they don't beef the right way. And it, it um, you can do it. Like you can build world-class stuff here with people that we have here without question. And you don't need the government to come first. You don't need like the investors to come first. Like you can just do it. And so that was the, the thing that I got from that. And I knew that um, because we were connecting translators and cultural experts that were in-country with these companies like Disney directly, they were being valued more than they would have had they gone through like a third party. And so that also, that social justice piece also started to shine up for me too. And so I've never backed down ever again. Like after Roll Point, it's like, we, we are world class. You can be. And so, and we showed that we could. So that was my, um, you know, I remember in 1998, I flew to Boston at Internet World. And so uh, we were part of this, it was the largest internet conference at the time. And so we showcased our stuff. We won best of show, you know, easily. And so, and I expected that. And, and not in an arrogant way, but in a way that, you know, there, there's so much brilliance here because we have all these cultures coming together. And I've seen that play out time and time again. That Forrest and I were in South Korea at the largest energy conference in the world, presenting Shifted Energy's early technology. And it's like 50,000 people at this conference. We win best of show for our technology there too. And it doesn't, I don't skip a heartbeat over that because I expect it. Not in an arrogant way, but in a way that honors that there's value here. That's special. This place is special. So that's, that's I learned that from World Point. So you think you would ever have thought that coming from where you came from without that experience? I hope I would have learned it eventually, but I was forced into it early on. My, I mean, the company started during my senior year of college, so I got that lesson early. But I was never pumped up from a self-value perspective. Um, and I still see that too. And so like to give you an example, when people hear my story and they hear that I was from KPT, I often get people who are overwhelmingly blown away, like, holy crap. When you break it down, what does that mean? That means that you had no expectations that I should ever do anything just because I'm from KPT. Like if I told you, like I grew up in Kahala and my two dads were, were the best surgeons on earth. And then I did what I did, like you wouldn't think anything. And so these expectations that apply to the kids in KPT are still alive today. And so I, I think I would have struggled to kind of break that because that's a really hard thing to break. Mm -hmm. And so Purple Mile is trying to break that. And so World Point broke it in spades for me, yeah. in some ways. Yeah, because I mean, imagine in high school, right? Right, your high school, you're you're in these different programs and all that, and then and then someone says, "No worries, all in. One day you're going to be doing all these other things." I mean, what would you have said? I would have said you've been. Buying stuff from this guy right yeah. here <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. next to me. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I mean, nobody would have even thought to tell me that. 
I think um, we were forgotten on campus. You know, at one point, we weren't allowed to eat food with the rest of the kids because we were so, so disruptive. Oh, yeah, like complete exile almost. Yeah, and maybe I shouldn't be saying stuff like this, but even our our teachers weren't the most ethical people. Like, um, I remember buying lunch for one of my teachers at the student rate, the forty five cents, because. He didn't want to pay the whatever the two ninety five that the teachers pay. Mm -hmm. You know what lesson did I get from that? You know, my teacher giving me forty five cents. Go get me lunch. Yeah, so, do my dirty work. Kinda. Yeah, like that. That's not a good lesson to teach a kid. So, what are the lessons that, or what are the things you keep in mind the most as you raise your kids? I think I have to be authentic, and so, which means that the pros and cons come as they come. I've got a lot of pros and I've got a lot of cons like everyone else. So, you know, one one part of me, I want my kids to figure this out for themselves because I don't think that I can tell them anything at all that that's going to make light bulbs go off. But I know that they can see how I live and regardless of what they feel now, it'll affect them later. And so it's the long play for me. It's like, I'm just living my life the way that I, I think I should. And I hope that that's enough of a basis for them to lean on when it's relevant in the future. And I'm not so focused on what I should be saying or what I should be coaching because um, I don't think that's worthwhile in some ways. So what would you say is the biggest thing you took away from your mother? And you you hold kind of dear to you today, and yeah, so and maybe even the story around that. Yeah, so that's that's my mom's story too. Like she, um, I remember before she passed away, she said, "What do you do?" And I was like, "Why?" She's like, "I don't know." My neighbor's asking me like, "What what you do?" And I said, "What did you say?" You know, she said, "I don't know. Like, I don't, maybe he's an attorney or something." Like she had no clue what I did. Yeah, you know? like absolutely no. But she knew it was like something cool. Yeah, so attorney came to mind, and I just had a laugh with her, and, and that's because she didn't care. Yeah, she didn't care. And how many people you know would would be in that position with their kids? Like, I don't think I've met anyone else that has no clue what their kids are doing, but still connected with their kids. And so, in some ways, like, holy crap, what a gift! What a gift that it did not matter what I did, but just you know, if you're kind and you're good and you are you're out there serving. And because that's what she did and she went out and served. And, you know, as a kid, I remember like these episodes where uh, like she took me to the, I, I guess they're called the Association of the Blind, like their annual fundraiser. And so they didn't have enough sighted people. So like a lot of the, the folks are blind. And so we're stuffing envelopes. And I just remember as, as a kid, like my, my job was quality control and getting in there. And I see like, you know, the guys are like stuffing and then they get it wrong. So now they're putting the address on the wrong side and I have to get in there and like fix those things. And and as a kid, like, what a gift to have been exposed to something like that. I mean, I hated it, hated it then. But so I, I think like, you know, Ryan and I, my fingers are a little all right, clean now, but you know, I went to the Lo'i with him yesterday. He brought four of his friends and their dads. And this was one of the first times I didn't jump in. Like he led the, the carving of this new row, the planting, and I didn't have to jump in because I, I could see and watch him and lead through that and, and, um, that's because he's been there so many times. He's seen Kilo in, in Hawaiian. You know, he's, he's observed. Um, and so, so I guess um, it's a long-winded thing of like the way that my mom was experiential, but also not materialistic is what I hope that I'm passing on to them. Like this, I don't dress very nice. Um, yeah, I live a pretty simple life. And, you know, we don't have experiences. I think, I don't think I've ever been to the movies with my kids together ever not once i went with noah because he wanted to see something but yeah we've never gone on like a disneyland trip or anything like that too so do you ever want to i don't but i don't think that i've I've asked him so like you know i was in morocco last year and i i asked my boys hey, you want to come with me like, i'm just going to do a walkabout and both of them like nah i don't think so yeah <laughs> like all my trips internationally in portugal was like you want to go go to europe I'm like no nah, not really yeah mm -hmm. so so I ask, but I don't push in, and because and, it's not it's not who we are now, because that's not how we lived. Yeah. What would be your favorite memory of your mother? Uh, that's a hard one. Um, 
I played baseball. Um, we were called the Hawaiians. We were living in Pololo housing at the time. We, I played for two years and we lost every single game for those two years. Like we were terrible. And um, once a year, each parent had the responsibility to, to, to feed the kids. And so, you know, it was really hard. We didn't have a lot of food, but I remember my mom would save up and, and she must have talked to the coaches. We, was, we were always towards the end of the year. So my, my guess is that she saved up and uh, she went all out, you know, and like she'd put a cookie in there that she bought from like the famous Amos guys and, and put sandwiches. She put a quarter in each one so that we could buy a, a, you know, a soda or, or some kind of ice pop or something after Lihimui, um ice cake. And, um, but I, I remember the joy in her in seeing her take care of the kids. And it, it's one of those things where like, you know, going back to that book, I don't think my mom would ever remember that at all, like that episode. But as a kid, I just remember loving seeing how she felt in giving and in that planning too. Like, like that was hard for her to do, but she did it. Yeah. And so, um, I know that's my favorite memory. Yeah. So if you could go back and kind of give younger Olin some advice or, or tips or anything or anything like, right. would you do it? And, and what would you, what would you do or say? Yeah. <clears throat> yes. Hypotheticals are interesting because, um, they're easy to blow off. Like, <laughs> of course I can't go back in time, but well, let's say I let yeah. you do it right now. Let's, yeah. let's say I'm going to give you, you can do it right now. Boom. Push the button. Go back. And go. Yeah. So I, I would go back. I would go back. Um, but, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm really struggling to think if there's anything I could have said that would have changed the trajectory of my life. Doesn't have to change the trajectory yeah. of your life. What would you like to tell your younger self? Let's call it yeah. 10 or so. I don't know. Yeah, maybe I, what I think, age would you go? Maybe what age would you go yeah. to? And what would you like to express? I guess I would go back to when my dad died and tell the younger me that, that it was okay. And to be kind. Yeah. Like that's it. Like just these two words, like keep these, when, when you're lost or you're sad or you're um, struggling, just go back to that space where you're in a position to be kind and you'll be okay. So I think that. And I think maybe let's go in the future then. What would you like to say to future Olin from here? Hmm. Yeah. I mean, I hope I have the privilege of growing old because that's a privilege denied to many. So I think, yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a really tough one. Yeah. I guess, um, I would tell the future me all the stories that I may have forgotten. You know, like we talked about, you started off by saying, you know, as we get old, those, um, neurons go, right? So they, they go. And so I, I think if I could remind the future me of all these stories that he may have, will for, forget, like it's a beautiful life and one worth remembering, especially those simple things, you know, and I, I mentioned beautiful, not in the, the, the sense of blessed, but beautiful in the sense of experiences. I hope I never forget them. Yeah. Are you native Hawaiian? Yes. Yeah. Do you know about your ancestors? Yeah, my mom was born Evelyn Mary Colony Kamako, and uh, her grandfather was one of the first homestead recipients. So he's from Maui. And when they opened homestead in the 30s, I still have a copy of the article in the, in the advertiser being one of the first. He had to build his own homestead. He had to survive in Waimanalo where there was no jobs and so he fished he built a home yeah he, he farmed taro and it and my mom told me these stories of him like uh, he 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 called a little bit each each day for the family and he he did it perhaps his wrist was sore but he used a wooden mallet not not a stone and he sang the same hawaiian melee every single day when he would kui kalo and so the thing that I'm most connected to is like, there's a story that is, I don't know all the stories that go back generation after generation. Well, what I do know is that my mom grew up in that culture of pounding taro and eating that as a staple. I now do that. 
and I've taught my kids how to do that. And we have these hundreds of years of unbroken history to the first ancestors that started doing that maybe a thousand years ago. And to me, that that is enough of a connection to hold on to this culture. And and it's pretty deep. Like, you know, that that predates the United States, you know, by two or three times and just an unbroken, simple thing in one family that has persisted for hundreds of years. And so, yeah, I know a lot more about our culture and stuff, but then like, that's the one thing that I, I connect to because it, again, it, it's like, I've learned that simplicity is what's inspirational. And in that simple act of feeding ourselves the same way is really damn inspirational to me. Can you track your genealogy back to you know, certain islands or chiefs yeah. and so on? Uh, I mean, my, my sister and mom did that. So I have a copy of the genealogy. I have never been a student of that. And so it's, it hasn't been like my interest to go back and, and know that, you know, I was told that if you want to stump an American, you simply ask them, name your great grandparents. And so, and I can't on my other side, but on the Hawaiian side, my sister and my mom chronicled that. So we go back to Maui. And we go back and we have all these names. In fact, I was on Maui two months ago with my uncle and, and uh, we were at a funeral and then he, we walked over to one of our other ancestors whose plot is there and he's sharing the story about him. Yeah. He wasn't a very kind person, but he was our ancestor. And so he kind of shared some of the stories. So I got to learn a little bit more about that particular ancestor as well too. And so I, I know some stories from, from here and there, but my grandmother was the last pure Hawaiian in our family. Are there any stories from, from that or from your, your ancestry that kind of stick out in your mind alongside with the one you just mentioned? No, the food one was something that's special because it's something I stumbled into. Mm. You know, like um, no one told me like there was this unbroken history. I had not heard that from anyone about in any other family as well too because we all stopped eating it. You know, poi was outlawed in the 20s. It had some pretty devastating consequences to our culture. And so my mom was never a Hawaiian um, scholar or, or one that shared a lot of these stories. And so I, I didn't get that. I was in college at, my first scholarship was with Kamehameha Schools. And so I read her will, Princess Pauahi's will, back in my freshman year, during my freshman year or sophomore year. And so those are the first periods of my life that I, I did some soul searching and reading. And I think like I've had some insights that come as a result of being such an outsider to my own culture. Like for example, when I did my walkabout in Madrid last year, I was doing that for King Kalakaua. I wanted to, to think and see what he saw. And yeah, I did that. And I saw sites that I think influenced him to build Iolani Palace. But then my thoughts came to Princess Pawahi. And it dawned on me to look up, like when did she um, give her land into this will? And what was the value at that time? And it blew me away to, to, to learn that the value of her estate at the time of her passing was about the same as what it cost to build Iolani Palace. And so for me, that was like mind-blowing. I had not, never read that anywhere. Like we could have had Kalakawa schools and Kamehameha schools, but no, we have Iolani Palace and we have Kamehameha schools. Or we could have had two palaces and no Kamehameha schools. And so here I am in, in Madrid amongst statues of men, like nothing but men and grandeur, uh, built using wealth that Spain got from their colonies. And this king trying to recreate some of that without colonies of his own, like it was pretty devastating for the nation of Hawaii to spend that much money on one building, nearly bankrupted the country. And so, um, so I, I think my vantage point as one that's now learning, you know, cause like you, you're, you're either Hawaiian or you're not. Like there's that blood perspective. And then there's some folks who are lucky enough that their parents have steeped them in the Hawaiian culture, whether they're Hawaiian or not. I didn't get that. And then there's that third group where by choice, you've made the choices to dive into your culture. So that's, that's the group that I fit in. So from the age of 18, I've gone in and learned pretty much nonstop. I'm not an expert in anything, but I have um, been more of a practitioner by just trying to figure things out and learn. But I'm also an innovator. Like, you know, one fun thing I'm doing now is uh, as one of our uh, side projects at the Lo'i is I want to figure out how to preserve fresh poi with no refrigeration. And I'm up to a year and a half 
Mm. And I'm going to crack this and figure this out. And so therefore, I is think- Is it we, sour? It's not sour at all. It's, it's still fresh. It's, um, it's it, you added water? Or yes. No? Or it's uh, just pot yai? It's not pot yai, though. Yeah. So, um, you know, some, some traditional folks that just store it as pot yai, our ancestors did that. It'll sour a little bit. Yeah. But not everybody likes sour poi. Mm-hmm. And so my method, um, this is the fourth attempt at it, but it's a method that it's a very simple way to create, you know, in Russia, when I lived in Russia, I learned how to can stuff. So I'm not canning poi, but I'm using some of those pasteurization techniques and it totally works. Like a high pressure pasteurization or something else? No. So um, the first step is to reduce the amount of uh, microbes in it. So instead of cooking the kalo raw, I will skin it and then cube it raw and then I will um, steam it or I'm pressure cooker it. And then I have a completely sterile blender that um, it's ready. So as soon as it's pow, it's, you know, it's piping hot, I will blend it with boiling water. And so now I've got a pretty, um, it's not, not a whole lot of things living in, in that poi at that time. Then I'll bag it anaerobic, uh, vacuum seal, and then I'll pasteurize it after that using my sous vide equipment. And so you hold it for a certain temperature for a certain time, and then it's shelf stable after that. So it's very simple. So it's, it's stuff that everyone has. And my, the way that I created this is it's got to be something that everybody can, can buy without needing special equipment. You got a blender. These sous vide wands are 50 bucks on Amazon. That's all you need. You can preserve poi. So do you think then that mm-hmm. by just preserving it for a longer shelf life, mm-hmm. you kill off more or less the life that's inside of it where, you know, some people believe that that's a lot of the health value in the kalo. That is true. You are killing off some of the things that make it amazing, the things that make it sour, right? But as soon as you open so it- probably like a probiotics of some right, sort. Right, but you're just pausing that. So what you're doing is you're taking a snapshot of Kahlo at that time, because as soon as I open that bag, it's fresh, but the next day it's not as fresh. In five days, it's sour again, right? So the, the life then begins exactly where it left off. Oh, so you ate it after- um, Oh yeah. After a year or so. And- I, I have three more bags left. So every two months or so, I'll eat a bag. And so I only have three more left from the last batch. So I, I've got it dated. So I think maybe next month, I'll crack another bag open. And then these bags will have gotten me to two years of testing. Yeah. Oh, so are you testing for like bacteria, yeast, and mold? Or are you just I just eat it. it. Yeah. <laughs> just go you for know, it. Either okay. you are a well, well you use a water filter or you become one, right? So yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm like the human tester. So if I'm not sick, then you know maybe that's not scientific, but- you know, I'm not doing this also as an academic. I'm doing this as a cultural practitioner, just trying these things. Because at the end of the day, if I can figure this out, now I can start mailing poi to my auntie in Mississippi. Like, hey, you want fresh poi? Yeah, I got you. Like, throw them in a, a bag, send it to her, and then she just cracks it open when she's ready. Wow. Restaurants that serve Hawaiian food can now receive these bags and store them versus needing to expensively store them frozen, right? When you freeze stuff, you also destroy part of the texture too. And so when you defrost it, the texture is never the same. And so it's possible, but um, you know, this is a, a method where fresh kalo becomes processed and then shipped. And then one of my um, uh, projects for my retirement is a method I've already sketched out. You know, like I, I led the team that built the ventilators when we didn't have any ventilators here, but I have a, another machine where uh, I can produce putyai at scale with the same texture, but mechanically. And so I want to build that because we got to get the price down. It's too expensive. Like I want families to have access to putt yai for like four bucks a pound yeah, versus like 30 bucks a pound. Yeah. Wow. But people still need to make money. So if I can solve that, then a farmer can still do the value add, make a profit, but still get that price down to four bucks. And so we'll see. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, if let's say you're going to lose all of your memory tomorrow. Yeah. And you could share one or two stories that you'd want to be able to remember tomorrow. And what would they be? Wow, that's tough because it would all be about family. And I've got too many stories that I would want to write down. So I guess if I only had two, then it would be one about my mom, my, I had two dads growing up, my biological dad and my, my dad that my mom was married to, and my three sisters. So my one story would be about all of them. So it would be this, because this, this, we don't have a story of all of us together, but I would definitely um, string together a few that preserve that. And the second one, of course, would be about my wife and my two kids. And well, what would it be? Like, 
Yeah. So like the one with my mom, I, I love the, the story about the baseball, like, you know, that 25 cents, but with my sisters, my sister, Julie, um, I remember as a really young kid, she took me camping and I was the youngest of all the kids. And there, you know, like 10 kids and two boogie boards. And she would be the one looking out for me to make sure that I got my turn. Like something that small, she probably doesn't remember that again, but like, holy crap, I remember that. You know, my, my older sister, Kathy, I, I remember her taking me from KPT. Uh, I was struggling there and taking me in like with no questions and, and raising me as her own. And so like the the amount of love that it took for her to sacrifice, like, you know, she's already low income and, and struggling herself, but to add one more mouth and one more thing in her life to deal with, like that was pure love because she needed that right now. My sister Kayleen would just be the, the pureness of her, even like my computer software didn't, didn't have its effect. You know, she had a really terrible uh, thing that it said about her and she still laughed. Right. And so like just that pureness of, of her, I would write that down because there's just so much joy there. And then my, um, my dad, Joe, my biological dad, when, when I was born, he wrote me a song. And I want to remember that families are messy and there's room for that group of my mom, her husband, I have his name, and my biological dad, all back in 1971, where my biological dad is so stoked that you know he has a kid and writes a song for me. And... His friend, my mom's husband, is also stoked that you know he has a son now to raise, even though it's not his biological son. And my mom is sort of in this space, and like that is such a good reminder that you know l families are messy, but love is pure. And so I, I never want to forget that. Like that is such a really powerful message. I want to remember that for for the the three of them. So I think I'd write those down, and that's enough. Yeah. I know we've been talking for kind of a long time, yeah. but is, is there anything that that you wanted to mention or share that I might have missed, forgot? Yeah, you know, I think these kinds of things are important to cherry pick in some ways, like these interesting parts of our lives. And um, But I fear that like social media, like everyone shares, and I'm guilty of that myself. Like I have rules where I, I don't, post anything materialistic. I don't, um, no make big body, no hog cheese and no talk stink. Like those are my three things. Like I don't break the kindness thing on, on social media. And so, but I think we share the best parts of our life. And I just hope that people don't compare it, I mean, it's hard not to, but it's hard, it's hard to like navigate life and you see these vignettes. And they, they have some relation to your own life and, or you reflect on it in, in some ways. But, you know, I, I think also um, the vast majority of my life has been in struggle, you know, just struggling in every way you can imagine from relationships to um, connections to um, self-worth. I mean, this, the list is endless. And so, and that's the work I still have to do and I still need to do. And I think all of us need that kind of work too. So. I guess my, in closing, I, I really want to hold space for that in that, um, you know, for whatever you got out of this video, there's a lot of struggle that I went through and there's a lot, a lot of struggle that I still need to go through and it's okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, cool. Well, thanks so much for spending time with me today. Yeah. This is an um, interesting talk story. So I appreciate you making time too. So. If you resonate with Greater Good Radio, please consider joining our community at www.greatergoodradio.com where you can get access to exclusive content and offerings. Hope to see you there soon.